Our scripture lesson today is from Psalm 121, the first three verses. I raise my eyes toward where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God won't let your foot slip. Your protector won't fall asleep on the job. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, as you've noticed in the bulletin today, I'm going to share with you some biblical insights on how to survive stress without distress. And I appreciate so much the two solos that we had today that helped me to feel the release of that stress, that Jesus came so that we might have that healing and that love and that we can cast our burdens upon Jesus. Between the health problems that my mother had when we first arrived here a year ago, my daughter having her blackout episodes and having to have a pacemaker inserted in October of this year, my husband fainting a few times and then having a bout of AFib last Sunday so that I wasn't able to come or go on that mission trip to Ecuador, I'm here to tell you I'm learning a good bit about stress. And I'm learning how to survive it. Much of what I'm going to share with you today are lessons that I have tried to employ in my life during all of these difficulties that my family has been going through. And with these family health concerns and the current sources of stress, I realize this is not the only time in my life that I have experienced stress. And it's not the last time in my life that I will ever experience stress either. For stress is everywhere in all of our lives, is ever pursuing us and pressing in upon all of our lives. You think about all of the issues in the news today and the things that we are confronting, they are sources of stress in so many of our lives. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual stress are real. We find it in our homes, we find it in community, we find it in the political sphere. We even find it within the church. We see it all four seasons of the year. Someone more clever than I has put together an acrostic using the letters of the word stress to remind us of the common sources of stress in our lives. Here's what they've said. Stress comes from shocking moments traumatic events, repetitious pressure from something in our life, errors that we make, and strain from stumbling through life, and struggles from financial pressures. Now I want to ask you if you will raise your hand if you have ever experienced any of those sources of stress. Ah, uh, yeah, not everybody raised their hand, so I'm going to ask you another question. Here's a little quiz. A little quiz to see how acquainted you are with what it means to be a person who has experienced stress. I'm going to start a sentence, and I want y'all to finish it. All right, here we go. I'm ready to throw in the... I'm at the end of my... I'm just a bundle of... Y'all are a little slow on that one. Maybe y'all aren't a bundle of nerves. My life is falling. I'm at my wits. I thought y'all were all stressed out. Yeah. And I'm the first to admit that I needed to write this sermon for myself just as much as for anyone else. I felt God nudging my heart to say, Becky, just breathe. Just breathe. Long ago, the psalmist who wrote Psalm 121 was certainly someone who recognized stress in his own life, recognized that he needed help outside of himself to face the challenges that life was throwing his way. And so as we read Psalm 121, it seems evident that the psalmist knew he didn't have the resources on his own to do what he needed to do 
to meet the task of the day. So he is ascending uphill with others to go to Jerusalem to worship God and reminding himself that when he gets to the top of the hill and is able to worship God, he will be in the presence of the one who can help him handle the stress that he is facing. The psalm begins, I lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The psalm is truly a psalm of ascent, and the person who wrote it is a leader of the people in Israel, presumably a strong leader of the people in Israel. And the incredible meaning of this psalm for us is that even strong leaders need help outside themselves. No matter how strong you think you are, and no matter how strong you really are, all of us have our limits as to the amount of stress that we can handle on our own. You know, my father was in the moving and storage business. He had a lot of trucks that traveled the roads and the highways of this state. And on the back of the truck, there were always these numbers that listed the weight that the truck was able to carry. Have you ever noticed that on the back of trucks, that they list the weight, weight limits? And there are all these way stations, right, on the side of the interstate. That's because trucks can only carry so much weight. We are the same way. And maybe because this is such a musical and music-oriented congregation, you might understand this analogy a little bit better. Do you know that a typical concert piano, I am told, has over 240 strings that are tuned and tightened to create a pull of 40,000 pounds on that frame? Is that right, Rick? Oh, Rick's gone. He's giving me a thumbs up. He's just sitting behind the piano. Thank you, Rick. Well, without that tension pulling on that frame, there would be no beautiful music that we just heard today. But if those strings are drawn too tight and you exert too much pressure, then the frame will crack and the piano will be destroyed. What's true of that concert piano What's true of those trucks is true of each one of us. We all have a limit as to how much stress we can handle on our own. And we need something or someone outside of ourselves to help us handle the stress that comes to us. How many of y'all have come to that point in your life where you recognize that you need help outside of yourself. We do. We all need to be able to admit that we need help outside of ourselves. Because the truth is, we do all have our limits. One of the messages that drilled into postmodern people these days is that we need to avoid stress, that that's the way we handle it, we just avoid it. And on one level, that's true. Because so much stress is self-imposed. We overextend ourselves. We overexert ourselves. We just push ourselves to the limit. But the truth is, even if you eliminate all of the self-induced stress in your life, stress is still going to happen to you. Stuff happens whether we want it to or not. All those things that I listed earlier that have happened in my life, those were not self-induced. My sister did not want to be in the hospital all these many days and be as ill as she is. Richard certainly didn't want to wake up last Sunday morning, short of breath and dizzy, and tell me that he thought it was best that I not go to Ecuador with the mission team. Stress is going to happen to all of us no matter what we try to do in our life. Because stress basically is when my can-do can't keep up with my want-to. When what we can do doesn't keep up with what we want to. That's exactly the problem that the disciples found themselves in in one of the most well-known stories in the Gospels. 
And so I want us to look at this gospel story today as a guide to help us see how Jesus handled stress and how Jesus instructs us on a way that we can survive stress without distress. If you have your Bible with you, or if you have one of those Bibles in the pew racks and you want to open it up, I encourage you to do so. It's the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter is what I want to look at. It's a story, like I say, that most of us know by heart. But I want you to look at it as a lesson in stress management. John, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 5. Jesus looks up and he sees a great crowd all around him. And he says to Philip, one of his disciples, Where shall we buy bread for all of these people to eat? And Philip has no idea how he's going to feed this mob of people. It's the story of the feeding of the 5,000, right? Now, certainly... Philip has a right to be concerned and stressed out over that. Think for yourself how you would feel if all of a sudden this afternoon I told you that five more people were going to go home with you today to eat lunch with you. Would you be a little bit stressed? Let alone 5,000 men plus their families that you all of a sudden have to feed. There's no way that they could feed all of those people. At least that's how it appears. But I want you to note in verse 6 of chapter 6, it says that Jesus asked how they were going to feed the multitude in order to test Philip. For Jesus already knew what he was going to do. And Jesus is telling us here that Philip's response is the same response that many of us have when the unexpected stressful things happen in life. He was living by fear instead of faith. He was worried and concerned and trying to call on his own resources. What can I do? I can't do anything. What can I do? I can't do anything. Henry Ward Beecher once said, every tomorrow has two handles, handle of faith and the handle of fear. And we have a choice. We can meet every tomorrow with fear or with faith. Philip was meeting it with fear. And Jesus wanted him to meet it with faith. Andrew is the second disciple who speaks up. And he seems to be in a panic as well. He says in verse 8, Well, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far can that go in feeding this many people? Now, can't you just see Philip and Andrew both? They're running around frantically, and they're looking for food, and all they find is this little bit, and they're like, oh, this is not enough. This is not enough. What are we going to do now? Panic sets in. But look at Jesus' response. You see, Jesus knew that panic never solves any problem. So the passage here, he teaches Philip and Andrew, and he teaches us how to stop panic, how to stop fear when stress enters our lives. Now to remember this process, I'm going to use the word stop. And each step is going to start with one of those letters. So the first step is sit down and stay calm. For that's exactly what Jesus tells them in verse 10. Jesus responds to the disciples' panic with a remarkably simple statement. If you have your own Bibles, you might want to underline it. For Jesus says, have the people sit down. Have you ever noticed what a calming effect that can have? When somebody is running around all helter-skelter, we typically do tell them, now just sit down and be calm. Sit down and rest. It stops your mind from racing as you stop your body from racing. Sometimes the best advice we can give to ourselves is to be still. As the Old Testament scripture says, be still and know God. Be still. And in that quiet moment, be able to get your thoughts together 
and to realize where you are and what's going on in the world. In other words, put your trust in God. Trust, as the psalmist says, that God neither sleeps nor slumbers. And God is watching over you. You can take a break from running around and being frantic and know that God is watching over you. That's the wisdom that we read in the psalm. The first step is to sit down and to stay calm. Now, there are some people who are very good at that step. But the problem is they get stuck there. Paralysis by analysis. Have you heard of that? People who just sit down and they say, I'm just going to pray about it and think about it. And they never do anything else about it. They just keep sitting through it. And it just seems to get worse and it just looms over them. But they say, well, I'm just praying about it. I'm just thinking about it. And God's going to give me a sign. Well, if you've ever been in that place, I want you to go back to this scripture and realize that this is your sign. Because the next step is listed right here. The next step is to take the resources you have. Take the resources that you have to manage that stress. Because there are always resources around to help us manage the stress. It's what a former youth director used to tell the youth in youth group. He said, don't tell me what you can't do, tell me what you can do. Look at the resources that God has provided for you. Change your focus from the problem to the power that is available to you, is the way another popular preacher has put it. You see, when we're focused on too many different things and distracted, we don't realize that there are resources around us, but as we sit in that calm place, we can open our eyes and see that there are resources available to us. That leads me to another question. Do you know the best way to swat a fly? You know, we're always trying to kill those flies, and it's hard to do. But fly neuroscience has come up with a way that we can swat those flies and get them out of our hair. They say that what you need to do is you need to take a piece of tissue paper in each one of your hands. And you need to move your hands an equidistance apart, just move them slightly in and out around the fly. You see, flies' brains are so wired that they can't focus but on one side at a time. And so when they see moving objects coming at, at them at both sides, their little brains don't know which angle to turn to get away. And so they're trapped. And that's the way we are. When so many things are coming at us, it's hard for us to focus and know where to go and what to do. But after we've sat down, and stayed calm, we can start to see a path forward, to see the resources that are there. In our own situation with all of the stress that we've been through, because it's been medical stress, some of the resources that have been provided for us have been the medical staff. Some of the resources that have been provided for us are each of you. People who have called us and offered prayer, people who have reached out to us, some of the resources provided to us have been the pastors of the church that my sister is a member of who have gone to the hospital and prayed with her and who have talked with us. There are always resources around to help us move forward in life. And the third step is to offer thanks for those resources and then to get to work using them. To get to work using them. In other words, we need to develop an attitude of gratitude for the gifts that are there. And in each one of those instances of the gifts that we have received, I have given God thanks. And I express my thanks to you today for the ways that you have reached out to me and to my family in these stressful times. An attitude of gratitude can change our perception of what we're going through. It can help us see those possibilities in front of us. And when the situation that is bringing stress into our lives does come to an end, Jesus shows us there's one last step. He tells the disciples, if you look at verse 12, he tells the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. 
Now I'm sure at least one of those disciples was grumbling. You want us to go around where 5,000 people have been sitting and gather up leftovers? Why? If you could multiply the food for that many people today, you can do it tomorrow. We don't need the leftovers. But Jesus was teaching them something very important. He was teaching them that when we go through difficult experiences in life, we can learn something from them that will help us in the future and that will help others. When we go through experiences in life that are difficult, we can learn things that make us better people, stronger people, that we can share with others to either help them when they enter a similar circumstance or they can help prevent them from experiencing that same circumstance because of what we have learned. I'm sure most of you have heard about the organization MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. In 1980, a heartbroken mother made a pledge in her deceased daughter's bedroom. Her 13-year-old daughter had been killed by a drunk driver, and in her grief, she decided to do something with the leftovers. She decided that she'd do something with her outrage over drunk driving. Joining together with a handful of other mothers, she started one of the great grassroots success stories in American history. The mother and her companions were indeed, as the name suggests, mad. They stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with politicians with their stats in hand, and they challenged society's view of driving while drinking. For at the time, people saw drinking and driving as acceptable, even laughable. But their work called and caused a visual reaction among people. They made hard, cold statistics come to life and changed the public perception of what is acceptable about drinking and driving. As a result, a mountain of traffic safety and victim rights registration has been passed. It's an amazing story. A mother, her determination, sparked by that traumatic, stressful loss in her life, has saved thousands of other mothers and fathers and family members from experiencing the same thing. The story of MAD continues to inspire other startup grassroots organizations like Mothers Demand Action that works for gun safety measures and an end to gun violence. Grassroots organizations like those are fueled by people who have lived through unimaginable, tragic, and stressful situations, but they had a desire to take the leftovers of their pain, their suffering, and their stress to help others. When stress enters your life, remember to follow this model, this model given to us in John chapter 6. Stop stress in his tracks. Sit down, take the resources that you have, Offer thanks and use those resources, and then pick up the leftovers to help others. May it be so for you and for me, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.